Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for agreeing to speak with me today about emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, I know you're quite busy in the psychology unit, but this won't take so long, but you know, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, what I needed to know is what is emotional intelligence? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the, the simplest way to think about it is it's people skills. It's, it is the ability to connect, to, to get people to want to help you to accomplish whatever the task is. Now, their, their core skills and their higher order skills. So some of the core skills are you know yourself, you understand what the issues are that you bring to the table. Another skill is you're able to... Sorry, sorry. when you say the issues that you bring to the table... Meaning, and so I'm talking about your psychological issues. Okay, all right. And see, part of the reason that that is important is that success in anything in life is 80% psychology, 20% mechanics. And so... It is for that reason that emotional intelligence is so important. So it, it's people skills, the ability to manage yourself on, from a psychological perspective and the ability to manage others. I think it's in a non-manipulative way because absolutely. that wouldn't sound... Yeah. Absolutely. And, and so, so some of the core skills, for example, are... Uh, knowing yourself really well so you understand what are your buttons yeah. how do you how do you interpret different things um, the degree to which you might distort an interpretation or a meaning um, another aspect of the core skills is you need to be able to maintain control even in situations where Things can get really, really tense and, and, and difficult. Um, and another another skill is the the importance of just reading others, sort of understanding what's going on inside somebody else's head. Um, that's also another core skill. Um, and it's recognizing when you're about to press their button and the baby's not doing it. Absolutely. And, and, and so, for example, another, another part of it actually is just knowing what is it that, what can you say or what can you do to influence them, to get them to, to, to want to, to help you in achieving whatever goal you, you have, okay. you know, set out for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, related to that, there is this issue about perception, you know, and part of emotional intelligence is about perceiving accurately. And, and that can be a little tricky because perceptions are kind of very subjective. You know, it's filtered through our five senses and because we're all we're all deleting and distorting and generalizing in our own unique ways um, perceptions tend to be perceptions are flawed and and so but part of emotional intelligence is is recognizing that we're constructing our world as we go through our world. And so it, it's an appreciation that how I might see things might be very, very different from how another person sees it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's having the flexibility of not getting too caught up with how you think things ought to be, but just simply trying to understand the other person's perspective so that once you have joined them, then you can then influence them in the way that you want. Okay, and I take it that you may have some negotiation around a situation, whatever Absolutely. it is that you're working on. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So is this a skill that you can learn? Can I improve oh. my emotional intelligence? Oh, absolutely. Now, another critical part of um, emotional intelligence is 
you have to be able to communicate. Absolutely. So all of this stuff can be going on in your head, but you must be able to communicate and communicate with flexibility. Now, many of these skills are not, they're skills that are not taught. Mm -hmm. Some people just have a, have a gift of connecting. They just know how to connect and they're doing it intuitively but they're absolutely skills that can be taught. Okay. Okay. And so there are ways to communicate so that your message, your, the message that you want to convey is heard. Um, there, are, there are very specific tools that can facilitate and enhance, enhance communication. There, there are exercises to do in order to understand yourself more, in order to understand others better. So yes, we can. There are tools and skills that people can acquire to, to get this thing that we're calling emotional intelligence. So these tools that you've mentioned, are they things that I can do myself or do I need to see a psychologist? Oh, oh you don't need to see a psychologist at all. So for example, um, a critical component of communication is your ability to establish rapport. Mm -hmm. in, in, in my field, we call that we need to, we need to have empathy. Mm -hmm. But when we take it out of the therapeutic context, it really is rapport. And what, what rapport is, is it's based on the premise that people who are like each other like each other mm -hmm. and so how does that translate into into practical terms here is how um, if you notice when you share something in common with somebody there's an instant connection and a bond that is created and so in the context of say communication or in the context of trying to understand somebody better if you do what they do, and, and we can kind of start with physiology. Mm -hmm. so, so one way to establish rapport with you, for example, I mean, you have your hand like that. Mm -hmm. And so if I, if I did that, okay. mm -hmm. you know, unconsciously, your mind registers that okay. we're doing something similar. Okay. Or, you know, I could... I could put my oh. body in the same posture that you have your body. Mm -hmm. And without knowing it consciously, we then get in sync. Okay. And see, once we're in sync, then you become less, less critical or less, you will object less. To whatever it is that I'm trying to convey to you. Okay. So, so this skill about matching and mirroring is a is a tool that you can teach anybody. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can also teach people how to recognize words that people use, and the words that we use represent how what we're doing inside of our heads. So, for example. Somebody who, who experiences their world visually mm -hmm. will use a lot of words that are about seeing. Okay. You see what I mean? Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Somebody who, who, who represents or experiences their, their, their world in terms of sounds, how does that sound to you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And somebody who experiences their world in terms of feelings, mm -hmm. you know. How do you feel about that? <laughs> absolutely. And so it, these, are, these are skills that can be taught. Yeah. And of course, like any new skill, when you're just learning it, it's going to feel like when you're learning how to ride a bike. Initially, it's going to feel awkward. Mm -hmm. But with practice, it becomes effortless. And so those core emotional intelligence skills, it... it learning how to communicate, learning how to connect, knowing yourself, those become a part of just how you operate. And the, the, the best way to get people to, to assist you 
is having the tools to influence them. So, so instead of telling people what to do, what emotional intelligence allows, allows you to accomplish is they're going to want to do this without you even having to say anything. Okay. Now, there are also some higher order emotional intelligence skills. Mm -hmm. and, and one, for example, is about these, these higher order skills are required for leadership. So the core skills are required for interpersonal just connection, just you being able to get the most out of your relationships. <clears throat> or engage the other person. Yes, in your, yes, yeah. and across the board. So not only in, not only in, in, in the work environment, but in, fam in your family, amongst your friends. Mm -hmm. So these skills are critical across the board whenever there is interaction. The higher order skills are are required if you're going to be in a position of leadership. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about taking responsibility. We're talking about having resolve. Okay. It's, it's those kinds of, and those kinds of skills as well. There are also aspects of emotional intelligence, but they're more, the higher order skills are, are more critical when we're talking about, you know, positions of leadership, being able to being able to influence at a different level. Okay, so because one of my questions that I was going to ask is what you would recommend for HR and organizational behavior students to take away from something like that. Okay, so uh, what I think, regardless of regardless of the regardless of the area of focus, but in particular, people in HR, people in HR you're getting the complaints from everybody in the organization. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one of the one of the challenges that all companies and organizations face, it's not the technical aspects of the work that create the challenge. It's the interpersonal piece. Mm -hmm. It is the ability of people to get along. Mm -hmm. It's the ability of people to stay motivated and focused and, and, and work as a team to achieve a particular goal. So, so someone in HR, somebody who's going to be in HR, emotional intelligence skills are critical mm -hmm. because not only do you have to manage yourself and so that you don't, you don't take out your frustration on somebody who is already just hanging on by their fingernails, it somebody in HR has to be able to separate their stuff from somebody else's stuff. So basically, emotional intelligence allows you to kind of be a practical psychologist. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's once you have this, the skills and the tools, it's not that you need a degree mm -hmm. in psychology. It really is about management of yourself okay. first so that you can then assist others in managing themselves. Okay, so do you have any particular recommendations? So I'm an HR person. If I am trying to test a new hire for fit in the organization mm -hmm. and I feel that a good degree of emotional intelligence would mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. something critical, mm -hmm. what sort of questions would I be asking that person to gauge? That's your, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would say the best, the, the best questions in a situation like that would be, Scenarios. So you would you would paint scenarios, and you just see how they. You give them a scenario about a, a potential issue, and just ask them what would they do. Okay. And 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 then you will get a sense about just how they're able to manage themselves, how they're able to manage others, how do they problem solve a situation, mm -hmm. so that they don't create more of a problem than, yes. than, than they started out. Yes. All right, I've had conversations with Clement Branch. He's one of the persons who works in the HR unit. Mm -hmm. And he feels that we have a lot of guilt in the Caribbean because mm -hmm. this is Jamaica. And we have mm -hmm. a lot of guilt here. We have a lot of anger. We, we do know about the anger and the guilt mm -hmm. and the shame and mm -hmm. the fear and things like those. Mm -hmm. So if we're working in a, in a context in which people experience these things, this is the baggage that they carry with them mm -hmm. into the organization. 
Um, how do we treat with that? Okay. Now, and and think we ourselves may have some of that. Right. Or, oh, right. Yeah. Right. I. If if I should start off with the issue about shame, how? One of the one of the things that I know, parenting practices. Um, we utilize shame quite a bit in order to in or in in part of our disciplining and raising our children mm -hmm. and this shame this shame can can spin off into guilt and and what happens when 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 we are not given an opportunity to kind of work through these types of things in our childhood we just kind of bring it along mm -hmm. in into adulthood and so you can imagine you have you have an organization with x amount of people and we all have our own luggage mm -hmm. with shame and guilt mm -hmm. and, and i'll come back to fear in a moment and so how it how it operates or how it plays out is that Things in the current environment tend to trigger these these baggages that we bring forward. Yes. So so simple innocuous comments. If there's a whole lot of shame, if there is a whole lot of guilt that's brought forward, becomes something bigger for the person. So 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 there is the tendency to misinterpret. Mm -hmm. Um, situations and communication um, what shame does is that it makes you it kind of creates a sort of I think paranoia might be too strong a word but it's a super sensitivity ah, yes. to to your 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 you're talking about me. You're you're putting me down. You are whatever it is Dis that you diss me. You're dissing yes, me. That's yes. it. You're mm -hmm. dissing me. Mm -hmm. And so, with that chip, with that sensitivity, a lot of communication gets bogged down mm -hmm. because because of the misinterpretation mm -hmm. that happens. Now, fear. Fear is an emotion that everybody feels, and 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 there there are two types of fear that all people kind of grapple with on some level. So, where one fear is that we will not be loved, mm. and another is that we're not good enough. Mm. Okay, and and you can see how the piece about I'm not good enough kind of fits in somewhat with the shame. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so we are, we are always, we are always engaging in mental gymnastics to kind of protect ourselves from these kind of negative emotions. Okay. Okay, and, and if we are unaware that these are issues for us, we just become absolutely, totally reactive to the environment. So we lash out, mm -hmm. okay? The person who is, who is aware that these might be issues and find some way to address and to resolve, when they come into a situation, they're going to be easier to be around because interpersonally, they're just going to be lighter. They're not bringing that baggage with them. Mm -hmm kind of from the past. And so the, the issue about organizations and work and emotional intelligence is that pe because people are bringing themselves to, to an environment, to work, mm -hmm. to a company, they can't help but bring their own, their baggage. And so work is just not about work. Yes. You can't get away from the psyche of the people with whom you're trying to, to get a task done. And so, what I think... You mean, when you say work is not about doing work, it work might be about me proving my worthiness to the world or something? Yes, so remember I said that 
80% of whatever is going on in any situation is about the psychology of the people mm -hmm. who are involved. Mm -hmm. And so even though, even though we may have been given a task, mm -hmm. our stuff gets put into the task. And very soon it's no longer about the task anymore. Mm -hmm. It is about the competition between me and you. Okay. Okay. It is about me feeling that you've tried to diss me and me and then I am going to retaliate. Mm -hmm. Now, when people are taught the skill of emotional intelligence, it gives them an opportunity to begin to look at themselves so that you cut down on the reactivity. So you you do less of the externalizing. Mm -hmm. So if something should happen and I feel angry, mm -hmm. With emotional intelligence, what you do, what you're taught to do is to go inside and look. Mm -hmm. What's going on with me yes. that is making me angry? Mm -hmm. It's not about what's out there. Mm -hmm. you know. And so the, the skill and the tool of emotional intelligence, when people master it, is that it, it's going to lessen the interpersonal conflicts that happen within an environment where you have where you have people coming together trying to do something. Okay. Okay, well, you know, for me, I think that one of the things that we need to do is to apply this to engaging Caribbean workers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's it's quite important in the work in HR, certainly mm -hmm. in the HRD unit. Mm -hmm. um, so what about us infusing something like this into our courses? I mean, oh, absolutely. Or, 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 or do you think it would be better to infuse it into the courses or to do separate work in this area? For I, think that, I think that we could do both. Mm -hmm. I think that we could absolutely do both. Now, the comment you made just made me think about something. And so the question is, if, 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 we, were to, if we were to recognize the importance across the board, mm -hmm. so it's not just for people who, are, who have people white collar jobs okay, or whatever okay, it is. Okay, okay. It needs to be for everybody. Mm -hmm. so, so one of the ways to kind of get people to buy in mm -hmm. to, this, to this concept is to help them to, so one easy way would be, would it be useful for you to learn some skills that will help you to manage stress? Yeah. Doesn't matter what life throws at you. There are some tools and some skills that you can use to not get so upset. And, and so almost everybody will say, yes, I would love to learn some things like that. And so... So you can get the buy-in from people who are all the way down at the bottom in an organization to all the way up. Because as human beings, there are certain things that affect all of us. Mm -hmm. And this idea about stress is just, just one of them. Mm -hmm. okay, so how would you define leadership? Huh? Well, leadership is the ability to influence another person. Um, leaders have that, that gift. Um, so they don't have to, they don't have to use their position to kind of bully you into doing what they want. People want to assist true leaders. And, and part of the reason for that is that a leader makes whatever the vision is, very clear. So a leader is able to communicate very well, very clearly what, what the goals are, what the vision is, what the mission is. And not only are they able to communicate that, they're able to then inspire or, or light the spark inside of the people who, who are around them to be part of this vision, to move this vision forward. Okay, and I think that they work well with getting feedback from the followers because there is literature that suggests that the followers influence the movement of the group as well. Well, absolutely. Now, the way that the, way that the dynamic is set up, mm -hmm. so even though they are followers, people are looking to somebody else to, to, to be the one out front. Okay. Okay? And, and so... 
followers are not going to want to to assist someone who they can't trust, mm -hmm. someone who doesn't communicate well, somebody who doesn't take responsibility, somebody who doesn't have resolve. They are integrity generally. Right, you know, right. Yeah. So, so followers are not going to line up behind somebody like that. Mm -hmm. And so some of, the, some of the, the, the earlier skills we were talking about in terms of emotional intelligence, a, a true leader already has those. Okay. Okay. But then there are these other higher order skills mm -hmm. that have to do with when things go wrong, a true leader takes responsibility for it. They don't blame other people. Mm -hmm. You know, they understand that I needed to do something and I didn't do it for whatever reason. And so it cuts down on the blaming and the pointing of fingers. They accept responsibility because they understand that with this, with this position of leadership comes this responsibility that the buck stops with me. And, and whatever it is that I'm getting, I, it, is, it is because of something that I'm doing or not doing. Mm -hmm. And so they, they own that so that they can then get feedback about how to adjust, what to do, how to, how to make changes so that the, the goals, you can continue with pursuing whatever the goals are. Okay, you know, um, I'm, I'm kind of struggling a little bit because of, all right, we're always hearing in the Caribbean that we lack leadership. We, mm -hmm. we, it, at, in all levels, in the home, right. in the organization, in the society. Right. Right. But thinking about what you had said earlier about emotional intelligence mm -hmm. and um, just some basic learnable, te teachable mm -hmm. skills, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's making me wonder then what really is the problem with our leaders? Because then it would seem that they haven't dealt with their baggage and they haven't, right. Right. you know, so that is a little... But, but in a way, it might be disturbing to think it now, but on the other hand, it gives, if, if these are teachable skills, then it gives a little hope that we could do something to fix mm -hmm. leadership. Right? And so here, here's a thought I'm having mm -hmm. in response to the comment you just made, is that we... In the Caribbean, we have a long way to go in terms of tapping into, uh, tapping into leadership. Mm -hmm. Now, we are, we are nowhere near where we could be. Mm -hmm. And we are still, we're still managing. Mm -hmm. And so the thought that came to me was, can you imagine how powerful and awesome we would be if we had leaders who who were true leaders mm -hmm. who really would step up to the plate and embody this this idea about trustworthiness about people being able to rely on you your word is your word there is transparency mm -hmm. i think that the caribbean would just be amazing Take off, yes. because you know in spite of the challenges we're having currently with leadership, mm -hmm. you know, we're still, we're still managing, yes. but we could do so much more exactly. than manage. But, um, all right, one of the things, though, in the kind of, we, we have a lot of charisma in the Caribbean. We're quite charismatic people. Mm -hmm. um, charisma can be inspiring, mm -hmm. I think, you know? So, yes, I, I was, I'm wondering how we can leverage that. If we have a lot of charisma in the society, and, and I mean, our organizational leaders are drawn from the wider society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They, they may be trained, but they still have that personal, right. that, that kind of right. personal power. Right. So if, if they have that, how can we leverage the charisma that we have to make that transformational? Have you ever given any thought to anything well, like that? Not before now. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm thinking, to me, charisma is, your, is just your ability to, to establish rapport and oh. connect. Uh -huh. So so that is charisma. But it, in my mind, leadership, that, that aspect is important for leadership, mm -hmm. but it's not the only thing that is important. Charisma is, 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 is an important part of it. But there are some other things that are critical for leadership. 
And as a leader, there is a certain courage mm -hmm. and resolve that is required. And so if, if you're not grounded inside yourself, the 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 first sign of disagreement from from others you might fold and so a true leader understands that there are times when you might have to stand alone mm -hmm. yeah. and it's okay and it's, and that's a different skill set than just being able to connect and and get people revved up and and riled up and Resolve is about the determination to stay the course, even when things don't, even when things don't seem to be working out as fast as you would have envisioned. Mm -hmm. But so what good leadership does is that not only do you have resolve and you have the courage, you're able to, you're able to reassure People, the people who are looking to you for guidance, so that so that you don't have mutiny. <laughs> people don't rise up and mm -hmm. so so. It's but again, all of these skills that we're talking about. If you notice, they're what we call soft skills. They're not technical. The technical stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not a it. It's not like learning a computer program. It really is about managing the psychology of yourself and the psychology of others. Okay. okay, so resolve is about how am I being when everything around me seems to be falling apart? Okay. Do I, do I, how do I keep my focus? What is it that I need to draw on inside of myself mm -hmm. to kind of help me not to fall apart? All right, so specifically for our issues in the Caribbean that we were talking about earlier, shame, guilt, fear, yes. how does the organizational leader treat with those? Now, now you see the reason that those might be really, really, really hard for yeah, yeah, those are, those are Yeah, those are serious Absolutely. psychological problems. Yeah. Because in any environment, your personal stuff is going to get triggered. Mm -hmm. And so if you are a leader and you're walking around with a lot of shame and guilt and fear, the first sign of anything that is in conflict with what you want yeah. is going to trigger you. A tantrum. <laughs> yes. It's going to trigger you and your ability, your ability to, to pull this courage and resolve yes. might, just, might just crumble. And, and so what it says is that if you are aspiring to become a leader, you got to start with yourself first. Mm -hmm. So, so the, way that, the way that I envisioned, mm -hmm. if you can't lead yourself, you can't lead others. Mm -hmm. So it, one of the things you were asking me about is how could we, how could we translate what we're talking about into something practical yes. that we could infuse in our programs here, HR, for example. So people need to be taught, how do you manage yourself, first mm -hmm. and foremost? Mm -hmm. Because if you can't manage yourself, you can't manage somebody else. And then to me, at the second layer is, you're taught how to manage one other person. Ah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're not manage, lead. Okay. You're taught okay. to lead okay. one other person. Mm -hmm. And then when you move from there, then you, you're taught how to lead a group. A small group. A small group. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you're talking about leading a community, a country. Okay. 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 So there, there, there are layers to this. Okay. But what happens in reality is, because people ignore the soft skills, you just throw people in a position mm -hmm. and you expect them to know what to do. Positional leadership is the lowest level of leadership. Mm -hmm. People only do what, what you ask them to do because of your position, and they do no more. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay? A true leader inspires somebody to do more than what the person ever thought they could do. Okay, and discretionary effort. 
and right. Yeah. Okay. So, so you know, you know when an organization is being led, led by a true leader. When people, without being told, they are, they are, they are shining and they are performing beyond what they even thought they were capable of. Okay. So that's what leader, a true leader, does. It inspires people okay. to be more, to do more. Okay, so you're saying that we should have some intentionality about developing Caribbean leaders Absolutely. at all levels. Absolutely. Absolutely. Who, who is going to do this? The universities? Who, who is going to do this? Well, I think, I, well, you could. <laughs> I could. <laughs> I mean, the power of one person to change true, the world. True, true. So, so because we're having this conversation, we could. Okay. All right. And, and do you have any examples of people we could model ourselves on? I mean, you, can you think of some really good Caribbean leaders around? Just off the top of the, just off the bat, you know. Um, good, oh gosh, that's awful, I can't think. <laughs> um, and it's, I... Mm -hmm. the, the last really amazing leader that I was Michael Manley. Now, I don't know how this might go across, but... Yeah. But, but... He was inspirational. He's... The, right. the, the definition of charisma, you know? Yeah. And, 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 and I remember at, when I was 12 years old, mm -hmm. I saw him... So, it was 1972. Mm -hmm. And he had come to my little my little village. He had come to Claremont mm -hmm. to do one of the political speeches. Mm -hmm. And I remember at 12 being so moved mm -hmm. and, and, and thinking that, wow, mm -hmm. I want to go do something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, whether you agreed with his politics or not, mm -hmm. what a leader does is that it is, he he or she inspires people at to all action. ages yes, to, action. to yes. want to be more. Yes, yes. Okay, wow. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so so that would be my personal, my personal and, experience. And I suppose, too, it depends on the, 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 because for some people, you saying Bolt is a, the ultimate, you know, because he inspires them to even get up and jog or something. Absolutely. You know, so I suppose it depends on the field. But, but now that you mention Bolt, it's not... What is interesting is what Bolt does is that Bolt inspires emotion inside of you. Okay. And the, the thing that gets us to get up off our butts and go do something is emotion. Mm -hmm. And so whether you're into running or not, getting, getting the energy from Bolt is going to is going to ignite you and make you want to go do whatever it is that you need to do for yourself. Okay. And so a lot of people, and I've heard this from clients, a lot of people just sit and watch the races mm -hmm. because they want to re-experience that feeling. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so emotion, emotion is behind every great achievement. And what a true leader does is that a true leader can stir you up so you feel. Mm -hmm. And when you feel, and when, and I'm talking about those emotions that lead you to action. Mm -hmm. When you feel, it's the energy that you're going to need to do everything that you, you want to do. Yeah, well, I, I read a statistic that said it was between 24 and 69 percent of your performance mm -hmm. was as a result of your emotional intelligence. Okay. So I know emotion must play Absolutely. a really big part. Absolutely, and a big part of a big part of testing your emotional intelligence is m mood. The management of your mood is a component. Mm. Okay. Okay. So so. If you're struggling with anxiety and depression and things like that, it's it's a reflection of how well you're not using mm -hmm. this the emotional intelligent aspect of self. Okay. 
And um, one little thing I was thinking about though, that as an HR mm -hmm. person, as somebody training HR people, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm just thinking too about um, counseling and things like those, you know, counseling in organizations for persons right. who may have right. the depression and the anger and that mm -hmm. sort of thing in organizations. Mm -hmm. You know, um, how much training, because n not because I can sort out my stuff, right. does it right. mean that I can sort out yours, you know? Right, right. Yeah. And so um, in the Caribbean, because, and it's not just in the Caribbean, but, but, Anything having to do with anxiety or depression or anything mental health wise, there's still this huge stigma no. that is associated with it. True. But here's what I know that in or you can help somebody address depression and anxiety without without having to take them through a counseling process. So you can show people what to do at the level of their mind so that they become their own psychologist so they don't so they don't have to go sit on a couch or, or, or go into a counselor's office. And I think that if if we treated it as if it were a skill, so so here are some skills and tools that you can use to ensure that if you ever get depressed or if you ever get anxious, here is what you do. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you that once you do this, you're going you're gonna to move out of mm -hmm. the sadness. You're going to move out of the anxiety. I think that if we took that approach, we would get more people to buy in. Okay. So, so their, their NL, neuro-linguistic programming tools, for example, that doesn't require you to be a psychologist. Mm -hmm. These tools work very, very quickly. They help people to understand how their neurology works with, so how the brain works and, and how the mind works and how both things together, we can, we can manipulate it and play around with it and change our mood mm -hmm. and our focus Kind of in a second. Okay. So, for example, there is there is this concept called the triad. Okay. So, we're using the triad whether we're feeling great or whether we're feeling awful. So, when we're feeling a particular way, we're doing something with our bodies. So, the triad literally is kind of like a triangle, and so at the base is what we're doing with our physiology. So, if you notice when you're sad. Or when you're you're slumped, you do, you know. So so if you're sad and you're slumped, just Sit sitting up. up straight with your shoulders back mm -hmm. sends a signal to the brain to get you out of sadness. Okay. okay. And it's as simple as that. Oh, okay. Changing your focus. What is it that people focus on when they're depressed? Everything that has gone wrong. Mm -hmm helping them to switch their focus. So what I'm saying is that in the management of self peace, there, like every other piece, there are tools that you can teach. Okay, wow, wow. <laughs> we need to continue this another time, Doc. All right. Yeah, well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay.